Hi guys, welcome back to part two of my March wrap up. If you haven't yet seen part one, please check that out first and then come on back here where I'll be discussing the last four of the eight books I read during the month of March, beginning with Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. Uh, it's a thin little classic. Um, the weird thing about this book is there are no chapters within it whatsoever, which actually made this little book kind of drag on a little bit. Uh, it's not the book I expected. Uh, it is told from a first person point of view of a man named Robinson Crusoe. Um, man with the worst luck ever. Uh, his father wants him to sort of settle down, lead a middle road, you know, get a career, family, and a comfortable life. But he has a bit of a wanderlust. He wants to sail, he wants to travel, um, and he immediately goes on a ship that shortly after sinks. He's rescued on board another ship, which then is captured by pirates, and he's kind of sold into slavery. And then he manages to get away and gets back home, gets on another ship, it shipwrecks and he's stuck in an island for like 20 plus years. Um, that's the kind of luck this guy has. It was a weird feeling. You kind of read about his early life and, and discussions with his father and his decisions and um, the things he goes through uh, even as a um, you know, prisoner of the pirates and a, and a slave and all this within like the first 60 pages or so. And then right after that, um, this is a point, it leads up to the point where his final shipwreck uh, abandoning him on this island um, and he's sort of lucky in a way because the ship is beached on the island. He's able to rescue a lot of supplies before it's washed back out to sea, including some pen and paper, which he decides to start a journal. And that's where you kind of pick up around page 60. You're reading the actual pages like of his journal. There are dates for, for a while there. It, it does that. Uh, and it begins with his early days. And what you just read in those first 60, first 60 pages, you get to reread a little bit again, within the pages of his journal. I'm thinking, I just, I just talked about all this. Why am I going over all this again? So that was a bit frustrating, that sort of repetitiveness of it, until the point where you're past that and you're seeing kind of what he goes through on the island. Now, I never felt there was like a big struggle, it seemed like, uh, or danger. He immediately um, is concerned about the situation he's in. Are there dangerous natives on the island? Are there, you know, wild beasts that could attack him? So he knows he has to build some sort of shelter and fortify that, like fenced and everything, and he built quite the little homestead. Uh, in fact, more than one, and in more than one location. And eventually, you know, it seems like he is the only one on the island until some 20 plus years, like I said, he finds a footprint in the sand and begins to question that. Um, but, you know, he's, he's raising crops, he's uh, domesticizing animals, and like goats, and he's getting goat's milk, he's making cheese. It, it just didn't seem the book like I was expecting. I was expecting something like Cast Away with Tom Hanks. If you've seen the movie, you know what I mean. Um, he goes through quite a bit. There's only one part within this book where he seemed to be in any kind of danger, and that's from a fever that gets kind of dangerously high, and you know, you don't have those kind of medications and things like that. Um, but with the amount of supplies he was able to salvage in various times, another instance comes up. It just seemed like there wasn't all that kind of danger. He's just sort of stuck, you know? Uh, and you'd also almost expect, again, like the Tom Hanks movie, you know, when you get a little loopy, you're on your own. Who else, you know, you're going to talk with and stuff? And it never really went there like I expected. Uh, the language is your typical kind of classic language. It's a little, a little archaic and stuff. There's some weird things with words ending in ED where they drop the E and put a little apostrophe in there, which I thought was kind of bizarre. And then the ending itself, too, uh, was a bit unsatisfying. Um... It wasn't the emotional kind of reunion thing you'd expect uh, or that I was hoping for, I guess. It, so overall, I only gave it about three stars. Like I said, it's maybe I went in with a preconceived notion of what I thought it was going to be and it just didn't live up to it. The next three books I'm going to talk about are all by the same author. Now, her actual name is Barbara Mertz. She's an Egyptologist who writes under two pen names. One of them is Barbara Michaels, which are sort of gothic mysteries, and then also uh, her other mystery series, which she writes under the name of Elizabeth Peters. And uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is one in her Vicky Bliss series. This is the first book in the series called Borrower of the Night. If I can see that, I have like a coat of arms on there. Um, yes, so Vicky Bliss is an art historian and she's American. And the basic premise behind this is she, along with another colleague, discover the um, some words in a text that hint that there is a altarpiece, an unknown wood-carved altarpiece by a famous carver of the 16th century uh, that's possibly in this medieval castle in Germany. And they set off to kind of investigate its um, 
you know, whether it exists or not. Um, I, I won't go into all, any more detail too much about it. It wasn't all that great, not as great as I remembered it. I think when I read these uh, quite some time ago, uh, I really enjoyed it. And I think the series does get better, but this first one, I didn't really get into the character all that much of Vicky Bliss. Um, she kind of annoyed me a little bit, to tell you the truth, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't really have a whole lot to say about this particular one. Overall, I just gave it three stars, uh, but I do remember reading quite a few of them in the series, so I must have liked them more and more as I went on, and we'll see. I'm going to try and track down some of the other ones as well, but uh, yeah, overall, I thought it was just okay, and I just gave it three stars. But what I really want to talk about is her other series, and it is one of my all-time favorites. It's the Amelia Peabody series. First book in that is Crocodile on the Sandbank. And then I also read uh, The Curse of the Pharaohs. Now these are rereads for me. Uh, it's quite a long series. I don't know the quite, I didn't look into the number, um, uh, how many there are. I think there's around 20 or something like that. But I never got that far into it. Maybe seven or eight books or so. And for some reason I just sort of tapered off. So I'm kind of revisiting these and enjoying every minute of it. Uh, I've always had a fascination with ancient history, uh, ancient Egyptian history. And in fact, I think at one point, nerdy person that I am, I subscribed to a magazine, which I, I want to say was called KMNT, something like that, all about, uh, you know, ancient Egypt and things. And I've read some other mystery series. There's one I, I highly recommend called the Lord Marin series by Linda S. Robinson. Um, the first one was the Murder in the Palace of Anubis. Really great series as well. But I was really into all this uh, ancient Egypt and Egyptology and stuff. And when I found these books, I fell in love with them. Uh, our main character, Amelia Peabody, is just fantastic. She's a 32-ish um, self-proclaimed spinster uh, who'd been taking care of her father who's a professor and he instilled this love of Egyptology in her and at his passing she uh, acquired an inheritance and decided to set off to Egypt and explore you know the pyramids which she's just absolutely fascinated with and all of the history there and in route she meets uh, a young woman called Evelyn Barton Forbes uh, a young woman who was um, engaged to her cousin, uh, but I think he was only after her inheritance that she was due. But when the inheritance fell through, uh, he kind of left her destitute. And when Amelia kind of runs into her, she's in quite dire straits. And she hires her along as sort of a traveling companion. But a definite friendship between the two ladies and Sue's, and off they go to Egypt. Now, while they're exploring some um, digs uh, over there, they run into the Emerson brothers. Uh, they are Egyptologists. There's uh, the younger brother, Walter, who approaches Amelia, knowing that um, recently she has arrived and she is carrying all these medicines and things with her. Uh, he asks her to help out his older brother, Radcliffe, who is um, very ill. And uh, <laughs> when Walter sees uh, Evelyn, there's an immediate attraction between the two. Um, but when Amelia and Radcliffe sort of meet, it's like, you know, fire and water, they just don't mix. It's just, it's its volatile, and uh, Radcliffe's a very headstrong, opinionated, a bit misogynistic uh, in his opinions of women, and um, they have no place in an Egyptological dig. He thinks they're just cumbersome and in the way. And But Amelia is also very headstrong and uh, very knowledgeable, and she is a take-charge person and no-nonsense, and she doesn't put up with anything that he says. Now, um, while there, there's uh, a mystery that sort of takes place within this first book, The Crocodile and the Sandbank. It's uh, a mystery without a murder in this case, uh, but there is a strange person walking around, or what appears to be a mummy, uh, and the natives think some curse has uh, come alive, and they are very fearful. So someone's obviously messing around with things and uh, trying to um, scare them off the dig possibly to get at the treasure that might be uh, lying within. Uh, what I really love about these stories is the humor. Um, Amelia, like I said, is just such a fantastic character. Her weapon of choice is a parasol, which she swings with a lot of accuracy and a lot of force. Um, the language uh, that this is written in, too, uh, is told from the first-person point of view of Amelia, um, basically as, as if she's writing to you, the reader. She's speaking to you. But her intention in these journals that she's writing is that they shall never be published within her lifetime. Um, there's a lot of vivid detail to history and the era um, and to Egyptology because, of course, the 
author of these books, Barbara Mertz, her true name, she has a PhD in Egyptology. So she brings a lot of knowledge and a lot of facts to the stories and really flesh them out. And uh, I absolutely love them. Um, there's a lot of subtle humor in there. Uh, Amelia has just such a great sarcastic wit. And I found myself laughing out loud. Uh, I, I'm listening to these currently on audio. And uh, I'm loving every minute. I'm actually, as I'm filming this, up to the fourth book. And there are moments when I'll just hear something and it'll, it's like it takes a second and just like I find myself laughing out loud. And I highly recommend these. Um, like I said, there there's so much to them. I mean, the mysteries aren't super, super deep. It's almost the characters themselves that bring these stories to life that I absolutely love. To really get a good idea of what these characters are like. If you've seen the movie um, The Mummy with Brendan Fraser, uh, his relationship with the woman, I don't know the actress, uh, um, is very similar. The way they first meet doesn't go very well. Um, she's a very knowledgeable person. She you know, worked as a librarian. She brings all these facts and things to her. And he has more of the, um, you know, he's been in the field. He's worked and, and, and done things like that. So, but their relationship and how it develops and, and all that, um, is very similar to the feelings you get when you're reading these particular books. Moving into the second book um, brings another character within, which is their son, Walter Peabody Emerson. Uh, and again, just like the movies of The Mummy, they have a very precocious uh, son. In fact, um, Amelia describes her son as uh, catastrophically precocious. They refer to him uh, by the nickname Ramses, uh, possibly to avoid the confusion of um, the first name, Walter, with uh, Radcliffe's younger brother, but um, Ramsey seemed to fit very well for that name. In this particular mystery, the um, curse of the pharaoh, the bodies start to pile up, and we get more of the murder aspect of a mystery uh, involved in through here. It does also get kind of bogged down with a lot of bizarre characters. Uh, it starts out with a man named Lord Baskerville, uh, an archaeologist working on a dig who suddenly dies and his wife Lady Baskerville asks Radcliffe to kind of come and continue working on the dig and finish things up. Um, but then um, a mysterious kind of floating figure in white, appears to be a woman floating in white, appears and again freaks out the natives and they think, you know, another curse or whatever. And uh, But a lot of other weird characters kind of come into it. But again, um, I think the series gets much better past these two books. I definitely love like the third and fourth book that I'm, I'm just recently listened to as well. But uh, I, I definitely give these first two, you know, start out with the beginning and, and get a feel for the characters and their relationships with them and with each other. And it's, it's just loads of laughs. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, I love Amelia's passion for Egyptology and everything around it, especially her passion for pyramids. Um, she'll find herself crawling into some very tight situations and, and even the things that their their son gets up to uh, is absolutely hilarious. The way he speaks, oh my gosh, uh, he will go off on uh, just a rant if they don't shut him down immediately. And I thought that some of those situations just cracked me up. But I highly recommend the Amelia Peabody series if you're looking for something a little bit different in the mystery genre. Um, I think you'll totally enjoy her character. Uh, she's been described, I think, I've seen a couple places as a Miss Marple meets Indiana Jones, which I could kind of see that. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love her. So, uh, gave five stars to both of these and I'm looking forward to, I think this time reading my way through all of them or listening my way through as many as I can. So that's my, uh, wrap up. Yep. For, uh, March on to April pretty soon. So hopefully I'll get that one out a little sooner. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you've read any of these, let me know down below and what you thought of them and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.